Coming up today, Seoul and Washington establish new guidelines to regulate biochemical samples coming into South Korea after the U.S. accidentally sent live anthrax to the country earlier this year. The UN General Assembly is due to vote on a resolution condemning human rights violations in North Korea. First, more schools in the U.S. say they have received threats similar to the one that prompted closures in Los Angeles this week, but all decide to stay open. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Friday, December 18th here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this morning, guidelines covering the shipment of biological samples from the U.S. to South Korea have been shored up after a live sample of anthrax was mistakenly sent to a U.S. military lab in Osan earlier this year. Our defense ministry correspondent, Kim Yong bin starts us off. Korea and the U.S. have agreed on establishing a new set of guidelines to regulate U.S. forces Korea shipments of live biochemical samples entering Korea. This comes after a live anthrax sample was mistakenly sent to the USFK Biochemical Laboratory at Osan Air Base in April. Since then, a joint Korea-U.S. working group was formed to look into whether the anthrax sample was properly handled, as well as measures that can prevent similar cases from happening. At no time were rock or U.S. personnel in any danger of exposure as a result of our compliance with established safety procedures. The Bacillus anthracis sample was safely packaged by the United States Department of Defense, shipped by Federal Express, and stored, handled, and destroyed by USFK in accordance with established safety procedures. But this wasn't the first time USFK brought in anthrax samples to the country. Initially, the USFK told Korea in May that only one anthrax sample had entered the country. But Korea's defense ministry revealed for the first time on Thursday that a total of 16 samples have been shipped since 2009, including the one in April. It was also confirmed that anthrax test samples were shipped to Korea 15 times from 2009 to 2014 for the purpose of equipment testing and proficiency training. The new guidelines will allow to jointly search any biochemical package coming into the country. The recommendation includes a notification process with information such as the shipping and receiving organization, the type, purpose and quantity of the sample, method of transport and so on. The guidelines which went immediately into effect were signed during the biannual joint committee meeting of SOFA on Thursday. Kim Yong-bin, Arirang News. Now, three lawmakers with close ties to An Chol Su have defected from Korea's main opposition party. The three are the first incumbent lawmakers to follow suit since the former New Politics Lives for Democracy co-chairman left the party last weekend. Park Ji Won reports. Newly independent lawmaker An Chol Su embarked on a two-day visit to Korea's western Jeollado province on Thursday to drum up support in the region. In a press conference held in the cities of Jeonju and Gwangju, both considered liberal strongholds, Ahn said he had to leave the party and start his own movement because he wasn't able to remake the party from within. Also on Thursday, less than a week after Ahn's departure from the party he co-founded, three NPAD lawmakers close to him announced they are following his lead. In a press conference on Thursday morning, two-term lawmakers Moon Byung-ho and Yoo sung yap and first-term lawmaker Hwang Ju-hong said they are leaving the party because it has failed to provide voters with hope and a vision for the country. They said they will aim for a new kind of politics that prioritizes the livelihoods of the people. We will fight the Sonori Party's pro-conglomerate policies while separating ourselves from the obsolete ideological politics of the opposition bloc. We'll defeat the Sonori Party with policies for the people. The party they've left is in disarray after Ahn's departure, which exacerbated a growing internal conflict over the party's direction. 
The defections represent another setback for current party leader Moon Jae-in, whose leadership was already being tested after floor leader Lee jong er went on a partial strike last week. While Moon said he will forge ahead with efforts to reform the party, he's facing strong criticism from within the party about the current situation. Both Moon and An have caused the public, which had been hoping for a healthy opposition bloc, so much frustration and despair, and they are not contributing to the development of Korean politics. Meanwhile, the ruling Senori party continued to criticize both An's new political movement and the main opposition party for neglecting their legislative duties and pressed the opposition bloc to cooperate in passing a slew of pending economy-related bills. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, the UN General Assembly is holding a plenary session to adopt a resolution on North Korea's human rights situation. The 193 member states are expected to vote on the resolution that calls for the North Korean leadership to be referred to the International Criminal Court for its ongoing systematic and gross violations of human rights. If passed, it will mark the 11th year the UN General Assembly has adopted a resolution on North Korean human rights since it was first introduced back in 2005. Last week, the UN Security Council held its second meeting on the issue to underscore the seriousness of the problem. A local court has cleared a Japanese reporter of defaming President Park and Hay, citing press freedom in its ruling. Seoul's foreign ministry says it hopes the verdict will mark an opportunity to improve relations with Japan. Kim Minji has the details. Not guilty. That was a ruling from the Seoul Central District Court to a Japanese journalist who had been indicted on charges of defaming President Park Geun-hye. In August last year, Desuya Gato, the former Seoul bureau chief of Japan Sankei Shimbun newspaper, reported on the whereabouts of President Park when the deadly Seoul ferry sank off Korea's southwestern coast, killing more than 300 people. Pak was absent for about seven hours, which sparked rumors that she was with an aide at an undisclosed location. Judge Lee dong said that while the defendant's article was inappropriate to some degree, it falls under the freedom of press in a democratic society, considering it was written to serve public interest. The judge added that the rumors Gato reported were not true, and while the article defamed the president as a person, it didn't as a public figure. Korean prosecutors previously demanded the court to hand down an 18-month prison term. After the ruling, Gato said in a news conference, the prosecutor should accept the court's decision as it is. Korean prosecutors should accept the verdict and not seek an appeal. Korea's foreign ministry says it expects the clearing of the case to be an opportunity to improve relations with Japan, which have been strained over Tokyo's historical wrongdoings. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe also welcomed the ruling, saying that he hopes it will have a positive effect on their bilateral relationship. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. Now, more schools across the United States say they have received threats similar to the ones received by the Los Angeles and New York school districts earlier this week, but it did not prompt them to cancel classes. U.S. media reported Thursday local time that public schools in Houston and Dallas in Texas and Miami and Fort Lauderdale in Florida received an email threat late Wednesday. But all schools decided to go on with classes as the threats were deemed not credible by law enforcement. No details about the email have been disclosed. The district's police de department activated its emergency response protocol and began working with other law enforcement agencies to make sure the schools were safe. However, two schools in Indiana cancelled classes Thursday after threats were made directly to the schools. Russian President Vladimir Putin says he sees no prospect of improving relations with Turkey after Ankara shot down one of Russia's warplanes last month. Speaking at his annual news conference on Thursday, Putin described Turkey's actions as an act of hostility, accusing the Turkish government of hiding behind its membership in NATO. He added that Russia-Turkey relations were unlikely to improve under Turkey's present leadership as they are, quote, licking America's privates, end quote. Putin also commented on Donald Trump, the Republican presidential frontrunner. 
He said he thought the billionaire businessman was a tremendous, talented and colourful person. Putin also welcomed Trump for saying he wanted the US to seek deeper, fuller relations with Moscow. Lawyers representing suspended FIFA president Sepp Blatter say they have presented evidence to a FIFA hearing that demonstrates he behaved properly and did not violate the organization's code of ethics. Blatter has now left FIFA after an eight-hour hearing. He denies charges that he approved the payment of more than two million US dollars to his former deputy Michel Platini. Platini says he'll boycott a hearing schedule for Friday calling his implication in the scandal a political move to keep him from running for FIFA's top job. The Ethics Committee's final verdict on Blatter and Platini will be announced next week. Now, the world is still taking stock of the US Federal Reserve's decision to raise rates for the first time in around a decade. Economic, key, economic policymakers in Korea say the country should be able to ride the wave, but they've vowed to keep a close watch on any new market developments. Our Hwang Jie has this report. A short term limited impact. That's how Korea's economic policymakers assess the effect of the Fed's rate rise on the domestic economy. They say the country's strong fundamentals will shield the economy from any immediate shocks. Korea's vast current account surplus and foreign reserves, as well as its fiscal soundness, will distinguish Korea from other emerging markets. Korea's top central banker, Lee ji added to the cautious optimism, saying the Fed's rate rise is not necessarily a cause for concern at this time, as the move was widely expected and the pace of the increase will be gradual. In fact, the local stock market and the foreign exchange front remained calm. The benchmark cost be edged up around half a percent to close at 1,977.96, while the Korean won weakened slightly against the greenback. Still, there are lingering concerns about the effect of the Fed's rate hike on other emerging markets or oil-rich countries and the toll it could take on the domestic economy as Korea's exports to emerging countries account for almost 60 percent of all outbound shipments. The corporate debt risk could rise in oil-rich countries and in some emerging markets, which will put a damper on Korea's exports. Given that Korea's economic policymakers have pledged to strengthen their monitoring of developments in the global market, especially in emerging Asian countries, and promise to keep on updating contingency plans if necessary. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, it's currently minus 7 degrees Celsius here in Seoul. And if you live in Korea or have ever visited at this time of year, you'll know just how bitterly cold the winters can be. For those fortunate enough, it means turning up the heat and bearing those uh, energy bills. But many people don't have that luxury. However, help is at hand to keep society's most vulnerable warm this winter. Uh, oh Soo-young has this report. The sound of chopping logs rings through Kaeryongmyeon, a small town in Korea's western Chungcheongnam-do province. Korea's cold winters mean heating bills tend to be high, a major source of strain and stress for the elderly and low-income families. Looking to lend a helping hand, workers at the Korea Forest Service are delivering logs to communities like this as part of their annual outreach. These logs are left over from our operations. We're distributing them to help our neighbours stay warm this winter. From November to February, trucks deliver 50,000 tonnes of firewood to households around the country. And this year, the outreach has expanded to 10,000 homes, 3,000 more than last year. I used to pick up bits of dead wood. I just shivered because of the cold. But this winter should be better. I'm so grateful for their help. Through these bundles of warmth, families in need can beat the cold and enjoy their Christmas and New Year around a toasty fire. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News.
Well, those are the stories we have for you on this Friday morning here in Seoul. For more of the latest, don't forget to check out the website, adilang.com forward slash news. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search for Adilang News, uh, like the page, and you can uh, watch uh, regular updates of our news broadcasts there as well. The end of the working week is almost upon us, so if we don't see you, have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.